Now, we, I take the studies, and so all the studies are up on the site. On, on the, you can get it through the, the uh, Sligo Presbyterian Facebook page and on the um, YouTube channel. And we have um, people all over the world end up listening to, to these. We have a fair number of people in Kenya and in Nigeria that listen to it. And so if you have any nasty things to say about Kenya or Nigeria, you, you probably want to wait until... <laughs> okay. <laughs> he has a new audience, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to introduce, yeah, see yeah, this, yeah. because you don't, you don't know, and, <laughs> and everyone there else here does. It would be a knows. big faux pas. It would be a big faux pas, <laughs> and uh, we, we don't need any more faux pas than we, we will already have in, in, this, uh, in this study. So, anyway, um, we're, looking, we're looking at Genesis. And uh, we are at the 11th chapter, uh, but to, to look at the 11th chapter, there's a, there's a continuity in, in Genesis. And remember, uh, there are certain things that I've suggested that we do as we approach it. Uh, and if you choose not to, that's fine. You know, that's, that's certainly your business. This is just an interp way that I believe is, is a good way to interpret it. And I think this is reflected in the work. And that'll explain why I'm going to approach it the way I do. We'll go through the, the passage the way we do. Uh, the Genesis is a book of uh, compiled, compiled stories. That it was an intentional compilation, so it's not like it's just been randomly thrown together. It was intentionally combined, therefore it was combined, these stories were combined for a reason, but they were independent stories. And coming from different places to different audiences, written at different times. And we've already talked about, even before we approach it, we've already talked about one way that you can kind of tell as you get into the, the stories themselves, you can tell the writer, you know, or the people who wrote the different stories by, you remember one of the ways? Maybe the detail. The well, the detail. And, and the name of God. And the name of God. The, the, the later, and they, so a lot of people call them priests, that's, that's fine. Uh, but some of the later work is very, very detailed. And in this very detailed stuff, they have used the name for God. Whenever God is mentioned in the story, it's the Hebrew word El or Elohim. And that's, that's God. And in those stories, you, it's always God. In other stories, the name for God are those four Hebrew letters that nobody is supposed to say. You know, because that is sort of the proper name for God. And in those, in English translations, generally that's translated Lord. And if you've got the certain kind of Bibles, it'll be Lord all in uppercase. You know, that's, that's the sign that they're using this name, proper name for God. And they do Lord because when the Hebrews would read this out loud, uh, those four letters, they didn't give vowel points. Uh, in he Hebrew, is all consonants. They don't have vowels in, in Hebrew. Uh, but they have, so it, you can't read it, you know, because you can't read a word that's only consonants. you got to have vowels. And so what they would do is they put vowels underneath the letters, and they call them vowel points, little dots and dashes. And that enabled you to read it out loud, read the word out loud. Well, for the name of God, they didn't do that because you were never supposed to say it. And when you hit, when a reader would read a passage of, in, in the, from the Old Testament and they would hit that name, instead of trying to pronounce it, they would use the Hebrew word Adonai, Adonai. And Adonai means Lord, like one with authority. And so when the Greeks translated the Old Testament, and this is way before Jesus, translated it from Hebrew to Greek, when they hit those four letters, they translated it by the Greek word for Lord, which is Kyrios. And so they translated it Kyrios. And so when the English translated it, that's what they did. But to signify that that was different than other places, they would put it in all, all caps. And that's the name of God in, in this strain. And when you compare them, there are other characteristics that are, that are different. 
and and we've talked about this in the last few weeks. You know, when the, when you look at the uh, the God stories, the, where God is identified as God, God is a little more distant, has more authority, but a little more distant. Uh, you've got in the Lord stories, God is very intimate. You know, He's walking. You, he's talking. He confronts people. He isn't up there, out there speaking. He is involved. And we're going to see that in the passage this, as we begin the Abraham, the Abram story today. We're going to see that. Um, now, as we've, so that's kind of the background. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm working with. So the, we've got what's called the redactor, the one who puts it together, the ones who put it together. They've got a narrative that they want to convey to their audience. And they're probably putting it together somewhere around 500 BC, 400, 500 BC. But some of the stories, particularly the Lord's stories, go way much further back than that. Um, and geographically, it's cool when you look at the Lord's stories, geographically in Palestine, they're all, all in an area. So it would say that probably that's the area where they came from, you know, these stories. Okay, uh, now we've looked at several stories, and, and I guess the, the fact that I mentioned the compiler, we get a flow through Genesis that's greater than the little stories involved. Now, we started, of course, Genesis by looking at what? What's the first thing you say? Okay, you look at creation, but I don't believe you've got one creation story. You have two written, again, by two different people at two different times, because one is a... God story, where God is mentioned, and the other one is a Lord story, and which is the first one? God. Oh, they get God story. The in the beginning was, and what was in the beginning? The beginning. Was there nothing in the beginning? Oh. No. What was in the beginning? Water, Water was in the beginning because the spirit of, the, of God was over the face of the deep. And water and water is a symbol of chaos. So at the beginning there's water, which tells us right away we're, we're looking at a story. You know, because there's this watery thing. And what does God do in the water with this, with, with this watery beginning? What does God do? He puts, he creates a bubble. He creates a bubble in this water, which becomes important later when we look at the Noah story. But he creates this bubble in the water. And he's very organized in the way he does it, right? Because on the first day, he does light. On the second day, he does uh, sea and air. On the third day, he does land. And then on the fifth day, he does the other lights, the smaller lights. Uh, the fourth day. Fifth day, he does birds and fish. And the sixth day, he does animals and, and humanity. On the, so humanity becomes the last of God's creation, right? And humanity has responsibility over that which God made. First chapter, structured God, place of humanity, pinnacle of creation, responsible. Second, we go to chapter two, and then he rests on the seventh day, which puts the Sabbath into creation, not just in the law of Moses later. Uh, second chapter, we got something different because at the, if at the beginning of chapter one we got this water, what do we have in chapter two? Remember how it's w the beginning in chapter two? Dry land. There's dry land. That's right, and he causes a mist to come up, you know, on the land, and and then he creates from the mud a little mud man, right? But he doesn't, in, the, in chapter 1, God is just doing it by his voice. Let there be, let there be, let there be. And everything he makes, he says, is very good. Is good. Very good. Boom. Now God, the Lord, in the second chapter, because we got a different, we got the Lord now, and the Lord is creating humanity, and we get this image of him forming a human being out of, out of the mud. You know, so he's doing it with his hands, not with his voice. And he's doing it first. And then he does what with it? He breathes, he breathes the Ruach, the Spirit of God, the breath of God, into this clay thing, and it becomes human, human living being. And the living being is called Adam because Adam is from 
the Adama, and Adama means dirt in Hebrew. So Adam is the one from the dirt. Uh, and really is a name that the Hebrews, a word Hebrews will associate with people. So the story of Adam, if you substitute Adam for human, you know, all of a sudden the story has a slightly different meaning. Uh, you're not talking about one person, you're talking about humanity. And so he, cre he creates at the beginning, the Lord creates at the beginning, and then what does he do? He has to name the animals. Yeah, why does he have to, were the animals there before him? No, they weren't, because he, God says, you know, sees that human, human is alone. So he starts making things, right? He starts making things. He starts making the animals. And it says he makes, and he breathes into the animals, the Ruach, the same spirit, and the animals become living, and Adam names them. But he creates Adam first, and then he creates everything else for Adam. So we've got this different, humanity is important, but for a different reason going to be important in the flood story. You know, so he does this, so he's, he's naming, still can't find somebody suited for him, you know, as a companion, even though a dog may be man's best friend. Yeah, you know, a surgical procedure. That's right. He, uh, he ends up needing something a little bit more, and so he, God creates, or the Lord creates Woman. Well, remember, she's not called Eve until the end of the story. And as a sign that Adam has authority, because he's the one that names her Eve, not God or the Lord. You know, he does it. You know, that's after they're thrown out of the garden. So the God, the Lord creates this companion. Now, we've got this creation. So humanity at the end of creation to care for it. The other story at the beginning of creation and everything was made for humanity. Now we got an issue, right? As we move into chapter f three, right? What's the problem in chapter three in Genesis? Uh, the serpent. Okay, we got a tree, right? God, the Lord puts a tree because they're in the garden, right? This wonderful garden. God puts a tree in the garden. And what's a tree? Good and evil, right? Which means they can choose good and evil right there. And the woman is deceived by eats the fruit what's the consequence of her eating that fruit even though God said don't do it what's the consequence of her eating the fruit the now fruit? she has to choose good and evil now she has to choose between good and evil before she didn't have to now she has to choose and she gives it to Adam and Adam resists nobly like any man like not at all she just says, eat that, and he says, sure. <laughs> and, and so what's the first thing that happens? Which is not an accident. Okay, again, according to this story. Their eyes were open. They saw that they were naked, and they didn't say they were naked and say, oh, you look pretty good. What's the first thing? Hi, hi. You, you feel shame. The first thing they do, their eyes were open, and they immediately feel shame, because that's what happens when you have to choose. Now you've got to decide, and they decide that that's shameful, so they end up hiding, and what ends up happening to them? God comes down. The Lord comes down, curses them, kicks them out of the garden, because you can't be in the garden. They are now, they've lost their innocence, they're not innocent anymore, can't be in the garden. That's a consequence of sin, right? But, what does God do? He makes them close at the end. So they don't have to feel shame. Boom, we move on to the next story. Who's the next story? Cain, Cain and Abel. What happens with Cain and Abel? Jealousy. Jealousy. All of a sudden Cain is, is jealous of his brother Abel and the sacrifice. Why does God accept one sacrifice over the other? Not mentioned, just does. That's the way life is. You know? Of course, it's, it's convenient that the one accept, that God accepts is the way the Hebrews sacrifice later. You know, so it's, it's that animal sacrifice, which is appropriate for herders. But that's the one God is touched by, and not by Cain's, makes Cain jealous. Again, the Lord talks to Cain, don't worry about it. You know, don't, don't stress out about this. Uh, Cain does, what does he do? Kills. Kills his brother, we got sin again. A little, we've descended now. Not only is it disobedience, now we've descended a little bit. And what's the consequence of the sin? Set, 
sent away. You are sent away and the ground is going to have weeds and it's going to be hard to live and life is going to, is going to stink on ice, right? And Cain says, and worse, people are going to, well, they kill me. people are going to kill you. People are going to kill you. Which, again, good reason why we probably shouldn't take this as historical because if we're talking about Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, there wouldn't be a heck of a lot of people around to kill Cain. But he's really stressed about it and God says they're going to do it. So Cain says, Lord have mercy, this is too much for me to handle. And then we got this little sign of grace. What does God do? Puts a mark on Cain. And now you're going to be, now I'm going to protect you. So in each, the same thing. Sin, consequence, grace. Sin, consequence, grace. What's the next? And then we got a lot of, you know, who shot who, who married whom kids and all that kind of jazz. Uh, and then what's the next big story? Noah. Noah and the flood. And this one, they blend those two stories together in a fascinating way. Because sometimes you read and it talks about God doing this, and sometimes you read and it's Lord. the Lord doing it, which exp explains why the destruction happened at all. Because in one, the God story, all of creation is evil. In the Lord story, and since God, man was created to take care of creation, if all of creation, then creation, all of creation can be destroyed. In the Lord story, only human beings are corrupt, but creation was made for humanity, so if humanity is corrupt, yeah, purpose. creation has no purpose because it was made for humanity. It doesn't have an independent purpose, at least by that strain. Either way, God decides he's going to do what? God or Lord, depending on Protect. which. He is going to, remember that bubble. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the Lord going to do? The ark. Going to remove the bubble. Going to remove it. Open the windows in the heavens, release the springs in the deep. That bubble of protection, surrounded by water, he's just going to, he's going to erase. And so chaos is going to reassert itself onto creation. Because humanity or creation has become so evil, consequence, God releases, re-releases chaos into his creation. Sign of grace? Ark. A little boat floating in the water. Floating in the water. And when you look at one of the streams, he takes, Noah takes what? If you look at the God story, he takes... Two of every kind. When you look at the Lord's story, he takes seven well seven pair, pair of clean animals. And two, two pair of unclean. Of unclean, which is good because later in the Lord's story, yeah. Noah does what? Sacrifice. Makes a sacrifice. And if there was only two of every kind and he performed a sacrifice, you know, he'd have to be sacrificing unicorns because whatever he sacrificed, if it's only two, wouldn't exist anymore. So... You know, again, we've got these two stories kind of blending and merging around. And so we've got, and God makes a promise twice, you know, that he's going to do, not, not going to destroy the earth water again, again, by water, not going to release chaos onto creation anymore. After the, after the, the uh, altar, you know, in the Lord's story, and then in the other, uh, the God story, he makes that decision without mention of a sacrifice, and he, that's the rainbow, puts the ark, his bow in the sky as a reminder that he will never release. Now, as soon as Noah is on dry land, what does he do? Plant a Plants a vineyard. What does he do with a vineyard? Make wine. Duh, makes wine. What does he do with the wine? Drinks it. How much does he drink? Excessive. A lot. <laughs> a lot. And Noah, having drunk a lot of wine, ends up naked. naked, as we would say down south. He is naked and passed out in his tent. And who walks in? <coughs> Ham. Ham walks in and he leaves and says to his brother, <gasps> Dad's naked. Dad is naked. You know, Dad is naked. Uh, if he was in Florida, he'd go to Walmart, but that's not, that's neither here nor there. Uh, the, um, but he's naked, and he says, look at that. But he goes, Dad is naked. Look at these pictures. I took on my phone. And the, the, uh, his brothers say, no, oh, they're not going to do it. They walk in backwards and they cover, because Jew, the Jews have always historically had this real concern about exposing the human body, and we talked about that a little bit uh, last week. And so, 
what does Noah, when he sobers up, what does Noah end up doing? Cursing. Cursing. Who curses Ham? But the curse seems to fall on, <laughs> on, on his son. And, Amen. you know, at one place it seems like the son is, you know, the grandson is the son. But it's Canaan, right, that ends up bearing. Canaan is going to serve the others, right? And Shem is going to be the... the uh, the bloodline, the bloodline of the Jews, you know, but he's going to Cain is going to be loved. Now that's really important in what we're looking at today. So Cain, Canaan is always going to be the the servant of the tribe. Yes, and then last week we looked at the ultimate sign of human sin, which was what in Genesis I think is the defining sign as the the redactor, as the organizer, puts these stories together. This is the low point for humanity. The Tower of Babel. And what happens in the Tower of Babel? They try to be God. They try to be, they're going to build, they want to build a tower to reach to the heavens. And when they do it, they will be God. And what does the Lord do? Again, a, another Lord story. What does the Lord do? Confuses we're going to confuse them. We're going to confuse them. And we'll scatter them all over the place and we're going to confuse the language so they can't work any work together anymore. Now, if we saw we saw uh, sin, consequence, grace. Sin, consequence, grace. Sin, consequence, grace. In the Tower of Babel, we've got sin, the desire to be God. Consequence, scattered and can't communicate. Grace, not yet. No grace, not yet. There's no grace in the story. But we see, we start seeing some grace at the very end of chapter 11 and into chapter 12. Because I think that's, as the right organizer of these stories, that's, that's sort of the flow he wants. These are not just isolated. He's tying them together into a narrative, which is really, really kind of exciting. You know, you, you, when I was in, in school, you know, you study Greek mythology. And those stories are just there. But what he, this guy is doing is he's taking stories and putting it into a narrative, putting it into a single it has a story. Continuity to it. Exactly, a flow, and and with with each with the stories keeping their integrity because he doesn't blend them together, but he he keeps them. But it has this this flow to it, which tells us he's got a purpose. Now, understand, and I think I mentioned this, he wasn't the only one. This, whoever, and it was probably more than one, but is putting these stories together. He's not the only one that did it. You know, there's a book called, a book called The Book of the Jubilees, which came after. And it, it's there in the Book of the Jubilees. You know something? This is in the Quran. So this is, this is part of the Quran, this story. So these are not, these are stories that other people have put into their narratives. This, we believe, is Word of God. Therefore, we, we look at it. Book of the Jubilees isn't. So it's not part of our Bible. So it's nice to know. It's interesting. But it doesn't have any meaning did, other than historical. the other meaning. books uh, take a different line of the truth? Well, what they, t what they tend to do, and, and we, see, we see this in the Bible that we've got. We've got an allusion to what they did with the Book of the Jubilees in the Bible we use. Because when you look at the story later, the biblical story later, you're going to, we're going to have four books that will deal with, uh, after, after Judges, with the stories of David, Samuel, and then David, and, and then the, the history of Israel to the, the two captivities, either the fall to the Assyrians or the fall to the Babylonians. We're going to see that in the first and second books of Samuel, first and second books of the Kings. And we're going to see that, that history. We're, we're going to see that same history in the first and second books of the Chronicles. Same history, same exact history, but it's going to be told in a radically different way. If you compare the books of the Chronicles with First and Second Samuel, First and Second King, man, you got you got a very different different story because the two compilers, the people that are compiling, have different perspectives, you know, are just different. And that's sort of what the books of the Ju the book of the Jubilees is. It's coming. It's it's coming from that priestly standpoint, that the bean counter, that structure, sacrificial side. And that's what we see in the Book of the Jubilees.
Uh, so it's a telling of Genesis from that, from that perspective. It, it, you lose some of that blending, some of that, the, the stories coming together. Okay, if you would open your Bibles now to, to 1127, and let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the Abraham story. Now, right at the beginning of the passage, we got what? What do we got right at the beginning? 27, 1127. Okay, we, we got... Yeah, that's right. We got a little genealogy. We got Terah, and he's the father of... Abraham. Yeah, and we're not going to worry about the other two because it's... Somebody else. Yeah, we're not worried about them. We're, we're worried about Abram. And it's really it's important because, and, and I'll tell you, with English, we lose this. But there's nothing we can do about it. Um, the names are significant. You know, the names are, are Hebrew words. And so Abram means father, exalted father. You know, important father. Big, big daddy sort of father. You know, so... That's his name. So when a, when a Hebrew person read this, you know, that's what they saw. When we read Abram in English, we say, oh, Abram, that's kind of an interesting name. Uh, you, we, we don't get that significance unless we choose to look for it. Uh, same thing with Adam. We don't know what it means unless we look at to try to figure out what the word means in Hebrew. So we have Abram, which means exalted father. Now, that's going to be used ironically a lot in this story, Right? Okay, so he's married. Who's he married to? Sarai. Sarai. And what is Sarai's condition? Barren. She is barren. Throw a dart at a Jewish woman in Genesis. Odds are you're going to hit one that's barren. There are barren women all over the place, according to the Genesis story. Why would there be so many barren women in, in the narrative, in the story itself? Because you can't have a miracle if... That's right. You can't have a miraculous birth unless you got somebody who's barren. And that's what we're going to see. That's going to be a pattern that's going to repeat itself. You know, you have one of the patriarchs married to a woman who's barren, and miraculously they're going to have a child. And that becomes, when you look at later in the Old Testament, and of course the New Testament, my gosh, that's a pattern. That's something that is a big deal. You know, how God is overcoming this, this physical issue. Okay, so, so we've, got, we've got Abram, who is named father, married to a woman who can't have children, which means the likelihood of him living up to his name is slim, slim to none, right? A little bit of irony here, right? And what happens with this little bunch? Okay, they, they left, they left um, Ur, and they're traveling, and Dad dies, right? And right at the beginning of chapter 12, what occurs that makes, is going to make all the difference? Actually, for the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Lord comes to Adam. The Lord, who comes? The Lord. the Lord. So we got a Lord story. And we've got the Lord coming to Abram. And what does the Lord do? When he comes to Abram. Tells him to just get up and go. He says, he says, get up and go. Okay? And Abram does. Well, is that all he says? Is that all? Does the Lord just say to, to Abram, I want you to go? To a place I'll show you. Right? And Yes! I I'm gonna bless you in all these ways. Now, that's really significant because what's happening here? When, when, when the Lord says to Abram, I want you to go to this place where I'm going to show you and I will give you all these blessings. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless your descendants and you know, if they curse you, I will curse them and da, da, da. all the families of the earth are going to be blessed and that's a wonderful thing, a thing that's going to carry over into the New Testament. Why is it significant that the promises God gives us this command and then promises, what is happening here? Covenant. A covenant. God is establishing a covenant, right? And what is a covenant? A deal. A deal, a contract. And you don't have a contract unless you have two people, two people and two sides. You've got to have consideration on both sides. And so God isn't just saying to Abram, go. And then he went. He's saying, go and I will do this you can do for me, this I will do for you. 
Okay, so he's establishing a covenant. Now we're going to see this several times with Abram and then Abraham a little bit later. Now again, this is in the this is in the Lord account, right? Now why did he pick out Abram? I'm glad there's silence. Because it doesn't say. It doesn't say anything about why. Why might that be important? That there's no, that the writer doesn't say, like with, you know, he doesn't say, Abram was a fine man, upstanding, godly man before, and then God came to him. Why is it significant that God doesn't, that the writer doesn't say that before? Because God can choose whomever he That's wishes. That's it. Who is in charge? God's in charge. And remember when we looked at Romans, there was a big deal in Romans that God cho chose Abraham not because Abraham was good. God chose Abraham because God chose Abraham. Right. And here, God chooses Abram, and that's what he does. And Abram does what? Okay. He responds. He responds and accepts the covenant. And how does he accept the covenant? Because he gets up and goes. By getting up and going. Therefore, he's showing trust. Now, remember, Paul makes a big deal of this in chapter 4 of, of Romans that we talked about. That Abraham, you trusted God. This is, Paul says, this is, this is sort of the defining example of faith. That Abraham would get up and go. You know, and that's what the Genesis story says. He, the covenant was made and he got up. And and went, and and where does he where does he go and where does he go, where where is he being led to go? Canaan. Canaan. Oh, wait a minute. Canaan. That means it's the land of the Canaanites. Ooh, the land of ham and other poor products. Oh man, Canaan. Oh, that sounds bad. What do we know about the Canaanites? It's tough work there. Yeah, they're no good. <laughs> let's let's call it. You know, let's be honest about it. A Canaanite is no good. You wouldn't want your daughter dating a Canaanite. I know I wouldn't. Well, Canaanites isn't are hard. Kind of ironic that you send your family there to, into the land you don't want them. How do you keep them separate? How indeed. That's why when Joshua enters the land to conquer the land, he's supposed to. He's told to kill every. Not only people, but every living thing. You're supposed to kill everything. But every human being, man, woman, and child, you're supposed to wipe them out. Because they're Canaanites. And Canaanites... And because they don't do that, you end up with Esther. Well, they, they're, well and they, yes, and then you get into <laughs> judges, and there are the people living in the land, so around. So, it, But here we they're going to the Canaanites... The writer, again, the compiler of the story, has already told us about Canaanites, right? So we already say, when we see that, we're thinking, yeah. You know, not necessarily land. The land is bad, but the people, ooh, ooh, they're a cursed people, ooh, right? So how is Abram's travel? So he's going to this land of Canaan, okay? How is the travel described? In some detail, right? He pitches his tent in different places. So geographically, we're 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 moving, right? And as he as he goes, uh, and he is sort of between Bethel and I. What does he? What does Abram do? He builds an altar, and and what is the? There is only one purpose. To an altar, an altar has one purpose, no other purpose but one. Only per reason for an altar. What's that? An sacrifice, 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 an offering. Yeah, an offering, but a sacrificial offering. That's the only reason you'd have an altar. So that you, and and on that altar you do a sacrifice. That's why in Roman Catholic churches you have altars because what's the sacrifice on the altar? The body and the blood. The body and the blood. The death of Christ. That occurs every single time the Mass is celebrated. That's a sacrificial offering in Roman Catholic theology. Do Presbyterians have altars? Heck no! Why don't we have altars? 
Because you want to be different. Why don't we have altars? Well, why don't we have altars? We don't have because we don't perform sacrifices anymore. You know, so there's no purpose to have an altar if you're not performing a sacrifice. Why do we call them altars? Good question. Good question. If you read like Calvin, he'd never call it an altar. You'd never see, it. and you'd never what see it in so, like Westminster. Them now. What, what, what do you call? Front of the church. Oh. Back of the church, front of the church, oh, okay. cable thing with a cross on it. I mean, that's. I mean, seriously, <laughs> that's what you call it. And and I know I've tried really intentionally not to call it an altar because an altar has a purpose, and the purpose is sacrifice. And we do not perform sacrifices anymore. And so that's why. That's why if you look at old old Calvinist Presbyterian churches, you have a table. You have a table there, and you have pulpits. And you have pulpits. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pulpits become really important because from pulpits, the, the, the word is read and proclaimed. And that becomes the center of the church rather than the an sacrifice. altar on which sacrifices are performed. So I think we call it altars because that's what people have done mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Probably shouldn't. It kind of muddies the water a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know... Uh, so anyway, he some builds an altar because he's going to. Yeah, it's like when I was in in West Virginia, we had a, um, we put in not West Virginia, uh, Montana, a long time ago. Uh, we had an organ that was an electronic organ, and we wanted speakers in the back, and you could get these speakers that looked like pipes. And so that's what we decided to get. We got these speakers that looked like pipes. It wasn't a pipe organ, but there were pipes in the back. Well, in the before we put the speakers in, there was a great big picture of Jesus in the back. And it was with the, he was with the lambs, or I, I don't remember what it was. I think it was. Knocking on the, it was, I don't remember what it was. I think it was with the lambs. And it was real back, high. And so since the pipes were going to be, we were going to have to take the picture down of, of Jesus moving someplace. Big, big, big picture. And so took it down. And that's something else that Reformed Christians tend to be very, if you look at the confessions, really sensitive about, is pictures of Jesus, a lot of pictures of Jesus, because pictures of Jesus get real close to graven images, idols. And so that's real sensitive when you look at the writings in the Reformation, that's really a sensitive sense of things. So we had this big picture. We're going to take it down. And decided we're going to put it in the fellowship hall. Now that's a congregational decision. That's not a theological problem, issue for me. And so we're going to put it in the fellowship hall. We had a woman in the church was incredibly upset. Incredibly upset. She said it should be in the sanctuary. We should, if it's not going to be out there, we should take it down, put it on the wall in the sanctuary. And she said because when people see it, they'll get quiet. They'll see it and they'll Get quiet when they see Jesus. And, and I thought, and I think I even mentioned it to Session because I was, I was young, which meant I was bolder and dumber then. So I did things that I probably wouldn't do now. I said, you know, that's one of the problems that the reformers were concerned about pictures. That all of a sudden that picture had... Way more meaning than... Had, po had power. Yeah, meaning and power. That picture could calm people down. That's getting really close. To an idol that's really, really close. It may not be there, but it's really, really close. And I said, that's, to me, that's a concern. Now, that was because I was supposed to be offering theological guidance. That concerns me a little bit. If it, I'm more concerned if it, do, if it works. <laughs> you know, if people do get quiet when they're in the presence of the picture of Jesus. That concerned me a little bit more than if it didn't. If it didn't work, you know, then it's, then it's a picture among pictures. But if it had special power, that's getting kind of close. So anyway, they are they build an altar, performs a sacrifice, right? You know, performs a sacrifice. It shows that Abra, Abram must be religious, right? Because yeah. so he performs a sacrifice. And and what does he ah? <laughs> So he's in the lion, and he does this sacrifice, he is present. Now, when we get to verse 10, we shift to another story, and we're going to kind of move through this story pretty, but we're going we're gonna to see this story again. So just file it away. This story is going to, we're going to see it two more times. Mm -hmm. What happens according to verse 11, uh, verse 10? There's a famine. Famine. Head off to Egypt. Famine in the land. Jeez, Louise, if you read Genesis... 
about famine in the land, you know, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream code, yada, yada. So this is a theme that you're going to use again, this famine in the land. This time it's Abram and Sarai going into the land of Egypt, right? And what, how this story works itself out, I find really kind of interesting. And what happens when they get into this land of Egypt? Abraham's afraid he's going to die. Well, Abram is concerned. And, and what is his concern? And I've had the same concern myself. I have had the same concern myself. This was a concern I had when we moved to Weirton. Same concern when we moved to Sligo. Exact same thing. Yeah, uh, because Sarai is beautiful. It's a looker. You know, she is at least a nine and a half. You know, she. She's a twelve. Yeah, yeah, maybe a twelve. Yeah, and because when people get a good look at Sarai. Hey, if you get Abraham out of the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're not talking about we're talking about divorce, right? No, we're not talking about <laughs> well, divorce. Well, that's what I'm doing. Quotation marks. You know, separation, they're gonna yeah, sure. separation. Yeah. So if if they, when they see how beautiful she is, they are going to bump off Big Daddy, right? And so Abram being the righteous moral person that he trusting is. Trusting God. Trusting God does what? Well, by the way, you know, it's, it's really interesting when he go, they go even, and see, I think this the, the redactor, the organizers of this story, they, this, they weren't stupid. They, he goes to Egypt. God sent him to the land of Cana, right? Did God send him into the land of Egypt? No. Doesn't say so. This was a decision Abram thought was a good idea. Well, so's this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So this was sort of, he's on his own. He goes to Egypt, right, with his gorgeous wife, and he comes out with a plan. Because if they see the Egyptians, and you know how Egyptians are, uh, when, when these, <laughs> I don't know how Egyptians are, uh, when they see him and his gorgeous wife, he is, they're going to, right, and, and just woo. Sarai. So he comes up with a strategy. And what's his strategy? To allow him to rule his sister. <laughs> yeah, he's going to say that, um, that Sarai is his sister. sister. Okay. And, and, so, um, and then they won't kill it, right? Well, that's another example. Did God say, Abram, you need to say Sarai is your sister. No, it's a decision he made, right? All right, so goes down, you know, that there, Abram enters, they enter, and the Sarai is beautiful, and what happens? Top dog wants it. Pharaoh wants Sarai. And there's no reason not to have her. And that's right, because he's just, in fact, and this is, would, would, I'll, Actually, yeah, this in a minute. He's so, a botter. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. He, um, so, brother Abram, sister Sarai, Pharaoh says Sarai would, would look nice on a coin. You know, she'd look nice. Uh, how about me, uh, me marrying Sarai? And me setting you up yeah, to so, all these sheep. Not only does <laughs> Abram survive, he flourishes. he flourishes. Pharaoh gives him all this stuff, right? Donkeys and sheep and more donkeys and camels and, and, and all kinds of stuff, right? And Abram waves goodbye to Sarai as she goes into the castle, right? And then starts enjoying his sheep and donkey and camels and all the stuff that he's got, right? Well, what happens to Pharaoh? His whole house gets buried. Well, there's a great plague. Uh, and um, evidently, they somehow, they, they know that it's because of Sarai. Because, and again, the writer of the story doesn't tell us how they know, because the writer doesn't care. You know, doesn't care why, how they found out. They just know that they have been afflicted because of Sarai. And Pharaoh does what? Kicks them out. Well, first he calls Abram and says, "What'd you do Abram this for?" And says, "What are you? What were you thinking?" 
And Abram says, and you know, I love this. Well, technically, you know, technically, you know, technically, I, I didn't lie that much. It wasn't a huge lie, you know. It was one more of omission. Yeah, there's a seed of truth somewhere underneath all of this. And, and Pharaoh says to him, you got to go. You got to go. What's fascinating, though, is when Abram leaves, he takes his stuff. He takes his stuff. <laughs> so this little ruse has made Abram wealthy. a really wealthy man. Now, let me ask you, and because I find this interesting. Remember, and we've talked about this before with the New Testament. They're writing this on papyri. I mean, that's, that's all they have to write on. Paper, we don't have paper. We're not going to have paper for a long, long time. So they're writing on either papyri or on vellum, which is animal skins, mm -hmm. both of which are expensive. really, really expensive. You know, that's why they crammed as many letters as you could because you couldn't waste space. Therefore, if they put something in, they consider it important. really important. Why would the Jews... Why would a Jewish redactor, an organizer of these stories, why would he choose? He, he could have just taken this story out. He didn't need to include this story. I mean, this story is not going to have any pertinence to the rest of the, the Abraham story, except he's, he's going to do it again. Uh, but it's not going to be, it's not, going to, it's not like if you take this out, oh, how did this happen? It's not like it's messing up continuity. But it why did he how feel that was necessary? What's that? Shows how, we got rich. shows how we got rich. That would be a good. That, that would be a reasonable. I find that fascinating because this story. There is no way you can read this story and say, "Oh, Abraham's a good guy, righteous man, righteous man," because he's not. This is a terrible story about Abram, and yet they included it. And I find that fascinating. That in their history, the most important person in their history, the father of their people. Here is a real stinker and a coward. Uh, I find that really interesting, that they wanted to make sure future generations understood that. By doing that, how are they shifting the focus? How does the focus shift? What could be the potential danger if the only stories about Abram or Abraham oh, were good and noble? Ah. He, he did everything right. That's right. Now Abram is this, maybe we should worship Abram. Maybe Abram is like... Well, don't you think that's not... A, if you're going to have an example like this, think about the society you would build if you, know, you have my wife, I want all your junk. Yep. And then give me my wife back and I'll go over here and I'll get all your junk. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's... Uh, it, it is a fascinating thing that evidently they wanted to make sure that the focus, this were, the people in the future, they weren't focusing on, on Abram or Abraham. And Isaac, Isaac is going to do the same. Isaac is going to do the same thing with Rebecca. Same thing with Rebecca later. Abram, Abraham's going to do it twice, and Isaac's going to do it once. Lord have mercy. And Jacob was named schemer. That's what Jacob means, supplanter. You know, he's, he, and he does. He cheats his father-in-law. He cheats his brother. I mean, he's a terrible person. These are terrible people. These are not moral paragons. So the focus has got to be on the God who is in control. The God, not the righteousness of the, the characters, the human characters, but God who is pushing the Don't story. you think that comes into Romans 8, 28, where God works all things Absolutely. good Absolutely. for those who love him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because otherwise, it's your story, not God's story. Absolutely. I, I, 100%. It, it, we, we lose focus on God, and we start focusing on self. And, and I find it fascinating, because other ancient societies didn't do this. And they had heroes, and, and these are not heroic figures. And it's interesting that a lot of times things that we think are bad are necessary to get to the next step. Yeah. Because, like, um, for my Sunday school lesson on Sunday, we discussed Ruth. And if they hadn't had a famine, and if the men hadn't died, 
Mm -hmm. Ruth and Boaz wouldn't have gotten married and we wouldn't have Jesus Christ. Right. I mean, right. if you didn't have all the bad right. along with the good, you can't get to where you get need to be. That Moabite woman. That her. Right, that Moabite woman in the, in the, the genealogy. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. All right, so we've got this story about Abram. We want to keep it on the back of our head because Abram wasn't chosen because he was a nice guy. He was chosen because God picked him, picked him and he responded with trust. But he did respond in trust, and we're going to see that throughout the Abraham story. Now when we get into the next chapter, we're in something brand new. And we'll, we'll really fly through this because this is a kind of an interesting, kind of a unique story. What's going on as we, we enter this next chapter? After Abram comes back from Egypt. He built another altar. Okay. Builds another altar. He's in the land, right? And what's the situation? Who's he with? He meets up with Lot. And, and who is Lot? His name. Okay. And Lot is there. Abram is there. And Why they're in this Lot land. Why did Lot go to Egypt? Was just he didn't. Uh, that, we don't know. Just well, realized. don't know. Don't care. Because the writer evidently may be talking about another strain, a story that Lot wasn't involved in this, this Egyptian story. Yeah. But he's there in the land, right? And he looks at the, the land and what, what do they decide? What's the problem? There's just too many sheep for the, all the grass. Both of them are so successful, we, the land isn't big enough for both of us. Canaan isn't big enough. For, can, isn't big enough. And so what do they end up doing? They end up splitting up. And who ends up choosing? Lot. Okay, Abram Lee lets Lot choose, and Lot chooses the better land. The better land. He's going to the plain, the well watered land, which means there's more grass. So he's going to go, go to the plain uh, where you have cities, because cities grow up in places where you, can, you, you got food. You gotta yeah, water. you got to have water, got to have food. You know, you don't build a city in the middle of a desert. You know, in fact, this he says is like Egypt. It's so prosperous with the Nile running through it. So, you know, they do that. Now he, the the writer gives us a hint about a story that's going to be coming later, where Lot chooses to go to Sodom, place where there's Sodom, and the writer tells us they're going to be they're well, they're wicked. You know, the people in Sodom are wicked, but that's kind of just like dropped in into this, and. So Abram is left with Canaan, right? The, the plains of Canaan. And what does the, how does the Lord respond to Abram's choice? That I'm going to settle in this land. How does the Lord respond to that? He's the he reiterates the covenant, right? <clears throat> the contract he's made, he restates it, right? And Abram does what? He goes and walks into the land. Goes into the land. And of course, builds an altar. <coughs> because, and it seems like every time an altar is built, he was like claiming that this is, this is his land when he builds this altar. Okay, so now we've got Lot somewhere else in the valley. And we've got Abram in Canaan, right? Where, right where God was leading him. And clearly God was happy because he restates the covenant. Now, chapter 14, how does chapter 14 begin? Well, there's going to be oh, some. Yeah, let's religion. read. Uh, let's some read religion. all the names. Some you know, <laughs> because I think that would be helpful. <laughs> some pillaging. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff going on there, right? Well, in a in a nutshell, what is occurring in in all of these these verses, these eleven verses that start the fourteenth chapter? What historically, politically, what is happening? This king takes this king, and then this king goes over here and does this, and then he goes over here and does this, and it's pillaging. War, you know, there you got fighting and war, and kings going to battle, and all kinds of stuff going on, you know. And then we've got the what? 12th verse, and who enters the 12th verse? We don't know any of these guys, and we really don't care, do we? I don't care about them. Until we see Lot. And what happens with Lot? He gets him and his potations yeah. get wrapped. He gets all messed up in this, right? And he take all his possessions are taken, and he's taken. So what does Abram do? He gets all his people and goes out. He gets all his people, and what ends up happening? They get them. He he gets them. 
he he wins, right? Mm -hmm. And God. I think it's significant that they had the exact number of trained men that went with him. Mm. Three hundred and eighteen. Okay. I don't know why it's significant, but why did they put it in there? It had to be significant. I don't know the significance, but I bet there is. And you're talking about a time when numbers are a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, to the ancient people, numbers are a big deal. And not always the, the number is how you get to the number becomes really important, how you arrive at that number. So I bet you it has some kind of significance, that, that number. Uh, but I don't know what it is. Um, so he wins, right? Mm -hmm. the, these bad kings that pick on Lot, they're defeated, right? And, and Abram gets Lot stuff back, gets all his stuff back. And, and then who shows, who shows up in verse 18? Melchizedek. 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 And how is Melchizedek? He's called a king, and he's king of what? Salem. Salem, okay. King peace. And, and he is called what? Yes. Yes, yes right. That's what, he, what, does he, what is he called? He's called King, priest of the Most, priest high, of God. The, of the most high God. Uh, now, Melchizedek, and, and Melchizedek will play a role in the New, New Testament. In Hebrews. In Hebrews, book of Hebrews. Melchizedek, because he talks about a priestly order that is greater or older than the Aaronite uh, priesthood, the priesthood around Aaron. You know, that this is, Melchizedek is the one you go to. And he's an interesting figure because he just shows up here. His name is also interesting. Because when you, when you look at Melech and Zadok are two Hebrew words. Melech means king. Zadok means righteous. So his proper name is righteous king. righteous king or king of righteousness. That's his name, Melchizedek. You know, uh, just flags go up a little bit. You know, we, are we talking about a historic figure? Or are we talking about something else in, as it works in this story? And he's king of Salem, which is peace. Shalom. It's, he's the king of peace. My gosh, the king of righteousness is the king of peace. And that sounds, sounds powerful, right? And so Melchizedek comes, uh, and he just shows up, and this is the only place he's going to show up in the Old Testament. And, and what does Melchizedek, and he's the, the priest of God Most High. And um, we, we, we talked... Bless his Yeah, we, we talked about this last time. Uh, the Hebrew word for, El, uh, for God is El. El. And you can see it in names. Whenever you see El, E-L in English, at the end of a name, God is probably a Hebrew name, and God is somehow involved. You know, Samuel, face, that means face, face of God. Uh, Daniel, or God's God looking at judge. you. Yes. So El is the Hebrew word for God. Um, and that's why in the, the God stories, El, that's what you see. El or Elohim, which is God plural. Uh, but you, you've got El all over the place. Now, when it says this, God most high, this is El Elyon. El Elyon in Hebrew, and Elyon means um, high, but it could be like God of the mountains, high, high God. Now that's, that's going to be different than that you will run across El Shaddai, which is another mm -hmm. designation. And in this, these ancient you know, peoples, they, these were viewed as gods. So El Elyon was viewed as not the God, but the God that you worship. Of all the Els, of all the Elohims, I'm worshiping God of the high places. And somebody else is saying, well, I'm worshiping the God of the God of power. You know, El Shaddai, I'm the God of the storm. It's, that's who I worship. And so, you know... The, these are different designations of God. And so this one is El Elyon, God Most High, and he's a high priest of it. Now something interesting, I mentioned it because something really interesting is going to happen at the end. And what does Melchizedek end up doing? Blessing. He blesses Abraham, right? And what does Abraham do? Pays a tithe. He pays a tithe, you know, 10%, which is going to become really, really important. 
And, and then how does the story end? So we've got Abraham only takes Lot, Lot's stuff back and leaves everything. He he, he takes because the king, you know, the the he only wants he wants to be paid. You know, the king says, "I'll pay you." You know, what do I owe you? And uh, Abram says, "I just want Lot's stuff." You know, that's that's all because I have sworn to allegiance. To I have sworn allegiance to the Lord. God Most High, the Lord El Elyon. Now that's really interesting. And then it says creator of heaven. Yeah. What, what has the writer done here? Which is, which is really, I think, significant. And I think the Jews would have picked up on this as they read it. Why is that so important that he says, I've sworn allegiance to the, the Lord, those four letters, the Lord Most High, El Elyon. What has what has the writer done by having Abraham say Abram say what he? Is? He doesn't have divided allegiance. And he's what he, he's taken these two, these two ideas of God, and done what with them? He's combined. He's brought them together. In other words, in other words, El Elyon isn't El Elyon isn't sitting here. El Shaddai isn't sitting here. The Lord isn't sitting there. Which is how ancient people viewed gods, you know, as people sitting around the table. What the writer has done is he's merged them. Merged them together. We're talking about different names for the same for the same being. being, the same identity is together, and and that is a profound, a powerful theological thing that he's that he's done in this writing, but and that's we're going to see that him continue to do that. It shows God. As one being, yes. many facets. Yes, yes, exactly. That that being most high he's is our part of. He's protector, but he's also our judge. He's Absolutely, pure. he's creator and and all powerful. What he's doing Sustainer, is he's you know, all of those things. He's taking all those designations for other gods and bringing it into the one as different dimensions of the same of the same deity. That's a powerful statement. That's when he does that. Powerful. That is an incredibly powerful thing that he does in that. And I think that's part of the reason why this is in. Not only do we have the tithe, and again, said it before, we want to look at these things that are going to be important later. Because we don't have any mention. Something else that I didn't mention is when he talks about moving around, some of the locations didn't exist that. Like there was no city of Dan. Because... The city of Dan is going to be, Dan. yeah, is going to be associated with uh, one Jacob, of the sons Jacob. of Jacob, and so th there's no Dan when when Abram, you know, if whenever this is supposed to take place, Dan doesn't exist because Dan's going to come later. But what he's doing is he's using images that the people that to whom he's writing they can identify. And it's interesting that Dan never really makes it to Dan; only Dan's. Descendants, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Right. Right. None of the, none of them do. Yeah. None of the patriarchs do. Uh, none of the tribes do. But it, it, this is a profound, powerful theological statement. As he's, and we're going to see that happen. So we're conditioned now when when we see someone talk about El Shaddai, you know that that's just a dimension of this single, this single God. L. Single L. L. Yes. These four letters that you're not supposed to say out loud. They're all dimensions of the same, the same deity. Uh, and that's going to be the one that's going to lead the people around. Okay, now this is the beginning of the story of Abram. What's your impression of Abram to this point? He's just like us. <laughs> He's just like us. Just like us, yeah. I, I, like, I, like I said, when I moved to, when I told, moved to Wharton, you know, I told him that Debbie was my sister. Did which that. which initially got me into trouble because we had Maggie and that that looked really bad you know I found that wasn't an advantage you know that was kind of a, a, a dis uh, uh, yeah faux pas <laughs> and then I said you know sister in Christ uh, you know, so we could cover it uh, but um, but I didn't want the mayor of Wharton to kill me you know would you no no of course you wouldn't Judy um, the um, so. Uh, 
So Abram is a person like, very similar to, to, to us. What makes then Abram special? God picked it. And God picked us. God picked it. And, and he responded by trusting God. God picked him and is going to use him to do enormous things. And he decided to trust in God. Now, remember I said there was no grace in the Babel story as the, as the organizer of the stories are shaping the broader narrative. I think this is the beginning. This is that sign of grace. And that sign of grace is going to continue through the whole biblical all story, the all the way through Jesus to Revelation mm -hmm. and the return of Jesus. Of, well, uh, a paradise. You know, the recreation of the world that that Paul described in the fifteenth chapter of First Corinthians, that John of Patmos describes in Revelation. This recreated order where uh, absolute freedom exists because we are no longer bound to having to make those choice, the choice between right and wrong, because right, done. right only exists. That's the only thing that exists. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the beginning, but we're just at the beginning of the Abram story. Oh, he's going to, he's going to do oh, good. He's, oh, he's going to do. He's a trip. Oh, Abram's going to be great. Like I said, he's going to lie about her again. You'd think he'd learn his lesson, but no, oh, wait, he's going to do wait, it again. Wait, wait, wait. There was no consequence for his actions at that time. He only got good stuff for, by, for being bad. Mm -hmm. So who's going to change what they do if there's no, no downside? He, there's no downside. And he's going to get away with it again. You know, he's, the, the patriarchs, think about that as we read it. Because sometimes we look at these people as paragons. Mm -hmm. These were not, these, these were not, these weren't necessarily good. They were very human people with, with well, he, negative sides. King David, he has so oh. many ups, downs through the whole thing. It's like, you know, and yet he's looked up to as like this, but there's some things yeah. he did. I, I don't think it's proper. A, a path David becomes this tragic figure at the end. After, oh. a, you know, after Bathsheba, David becomes, loses control of his family. And at the end, when you look at the end of the David stories, you know, this... He's this, running away from his well, kids. Well, even after he runs, when that's yeah. all settled. But remember, when Absalom dies, he cries. And Abner has to say, you've got to straighten yourself out. Because your soldiers are out there. They risk their life to defeat your son, who is trying to take your th throne. You should be celebrating that we won, and you're mourning. Because Absalom, the guy who rebelled against you, you gotta start, you know, David, you gotta, you gotta wake up. He's a pathetic figure at the end, and at the end, I love at the very end of the David stories. This guy who has been dashing, who's led armies and bands and done all this stuff, and women love him and has all this power. And at the end, when he's a doddering old man, he has to have, he has young women sleeping with, with, sleep with him, but to keep him warm uh, because he's yeah. cold all the time. He, after, after Bathsheba, David becomes a, a really sad, a sad character. A whore. Nothing good happens to David after Bathsheba. Nothing good. Uh, it's just a sad, sad story. So behavior has consequences. It, it, you know, behavior it has does, consequences. but Abraham does not. Abraham, Abraham doesn't, but you know, yet, that's, yet, that's sure, right. Sure that's there's, that's there's exactly right. That Abraham, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. God will make sure that Abraham goes. Again. Yeah. Because choices have consequences, period. Yeah, he's going to have Hagar and Sarai, or Sarah, fighting with one another. Well, that's going to be a consequence, that's gonna too. That's going to be a peaceful way to live. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he's happy about that. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, next time we're going to look at, at Genesis 15, 1 through 17, 27. So we're going to look at the next few chapters, three chapters. More about Abram. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to look at your word. Remind us that this is your story. You, you use Abram to, to further your will, but it's not because Abram is, a, is a, some kind of a superhero or super righteous, he's, he's, he's got feet of clay, just like us. And yet he's used to, to demonstrate your grace and be the, the father of many and the blessing to the nations. So remind us as we go about our living, help us to look to you 
and help us to see how we might serve you or how you might use us. And like Abraham, help us respond by trusting you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen, amen.